Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, September 8th, October, <laughs> September 8th CISA meeting. It is 5.15 and time for the meeting, and so uh, we will start the meeting now with the approval of the minutes of the August 11th, 2022 meeting. Does anybody find any discrepancies in there that they need to change or talk, or if not, could we have a, a motion to accept those? Motion by Alder Gisselman to accept the minutes. Uh, second by Alder Hinky. All those in favor of accepting these signify by saying aye. 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 And that passes unanimously. And then we will go on to item number two. Discussion of possible action on parking restrictions on 3rd Street between East Wassa Avenue and Bridge Street. And I think uh, we have a citizen here that would like to comment on that. So would you like to come up to the microphone and state your name and address and go for it? Sure. My name is Liz Hauser. I live at 2106 North 3rd Street. And um, every year there's a problem when the woodchucks play because people park on both sides of the street. Trucks come down because it's a truck route. They have to go straight down the middle. People park over my driveway every year. I've called and complained, and I don't see it really being taken care of. I would like to see no parking on the side of the street that I live on because all of ours has driveways. The other side of the street doesn't have any driveways, and it's very difficult getting out of our driveway when there's a game going on. It's dangerous. And it's an inconvenience to us when, again, when people are parked over our driveways. And that happens every year, multiple times throughout the time. That can get real aggravating. There is, a, in case you're probably aware of, there is a four foot rule. Yeah, and they don't so, even abide by that. So, Alan, would you like to comment on this? I guess what I can comment on is I know Eric had received a, a concern, and I believe it was from uh, Ms. Hauser about this. So, we went out and looked at. Uh, uh, Matt uh, Guptail in our JS department had went out and, and he documented all the signs that are out there. So basically, it's no parking odd number of day or uh, odd numbered days on the west side of the street. No parking even number days on the east side of the street. And it's that way the entire length. But for some reason, there's no signs between Lincoln and Humboldt on the west side of the street. I'm not sure if it got knocked down and never put up, but it just seems odd that all the other blocks are that way and that one block is missing. Um, I also did notice that there's um, no parking on the side of the street between Chicago and Bridge on the west side, and there's a very limited amount of parking on the east side. I guess if we were to stick with this parking, my recommendation be to just post no parking on both sides of the street there between Chicago and Bridge just because of the busyness and the closeness to Bridge Street and the turning off and on in Bridge Street there that I don't believe anybody should be parking in that short little block. Um, but as far as the rest of it, I did uh, receive another call. I mean, letters were sent out to all the residents along the street, and I only got one other call, and that was from um, a Carly Schwantz. She lives at 2108 North 3rd Street, and she didn't have any issues with the existing parking and said to leave it as it is posted now with even our different sides of the street. And those are the only two comments that I received. Can I comment on that? Sure. She's hardly ever home because she usually works at night. So when this happens with the woodchucks, she's not even there. She's another, my neighbor right next to me. Yep. And another reason this is on, when we started looking into this, none of this parking restrictions in this section is in the, the um, municipal code. So for some reason it was just posted but never put in a code. So that's why I'm bringing it. If we want to make this the code, it, it should go through and approved by this committee and then approved by council and then put in the municipal code. So right, right now those signs really have, they're just signs. And one other comment on the other side of the street right across from me, it says no parking here to the corner. People are always parked in that area that says no parking. So I don't know if that's part of the code, but it's only yellow right by the crosswalk, but it probably should be yellow all the way to that sign. I guess my only thought would be if you see parking people parking in a no parking zone would be to call the parking patrol and they would they don't really do anything about off, it offer a, offer a ticket 
because that's I've I've called them in the past and they have they have worked for me so. Alder Rasmussen. Thank you. Um, just a question. So you live on the west side of the street or the east side? I live on the west side. You're on the west side. And our driveways all come out onto Third Street. But the other side, side has alley driveways, right? Correct. So okay. So this that's where this even odd thing is a little confusing because not only is it confusing for people using the parking, but if there's one side of the street that's clearly different than the other, it doesn't make sense to me that we would even mess around with even odd and have people try to figure out what day it is. Restrict the side that has the problem and let the other side do what it needs to do. So, uh, to me, it would make sense if we would restrict the entire west side, um, which then seems to solve the driveway problem for all the neighbors. I can't imagine also that there hasn't been some issue. If this is depending on when this is happening, have we had issues with snow removal and trash pickup because of this parking, or is it so short lived and during the summer season that it doesn't matter? I don't. I think Third Street is parked up very much, other than the Woodchucks games. But I Correct. guess I would. Yeah. I think it's pretty. I don't think a lot of people like to park out there just because the amount of traffic on Third. Right. In the winter, it's very hard because again, when those trucks, it's a truck route. Right. So when the trucks come down, and during the Chucks games, they do park on both sides, even though those signs are there, and most people don't know that it's not in the code. I only knew because I had talked mm -hmm. to Eric personally and stuff and so when those trucks come down they're right down the middle and if somebody is coming north then guess what they have to stop because that truck is has no place to move because it's so limited on how much space is there well and the parking in a no parking zone is clearly an enforcement problem that needs to get solved with some more aggressive parking enforcement um you know but this situation you know is, is it even prudent for us to Put people through the even odd delineation. I mean, if there's if it's easier, um, if there's no access issue on the east side of the street for the homeowners there, and they all can get in and out, and they don't have a sight line issue trying to get into and out of their driveway, why would we not just restrict the west side then? There are limit. There are more driveways on the west, but uh, just to be clear, there are some driveways on the east side as well. There are a few driveways. They must be further down the street. Not not in your block, but yes, further south there are. Some. So in and the parking problem is probably worse the closer to Athletic Park you get. Mm -hmm. So maybe those first couple blocks there, where her problem is the worst, maybe the even odd doesn't make sense there. So, you know, is it an option to restrict the west side, in at least those first two blocks south of Wasa Avenue? It, anything's an option. It, I, Go ahead, Eric. I, I think one of the things, you know, that, that we look at, too, with signing of streets is making it as simple as possible. So, um, you know, and, and the other thing is, is with this, I mean, you can see how many signs are up a, a, along this stretch, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. And so um, it does make sense to, um, to kind of understand what the residents want to get their feedback, but then... Uh, to really make it as simple as possible and to restrict parking, you know, just to one side of the street that um, And then if we do have issues uh, We don't I haven't heard of anything with the plowing in the winter and stuff because mm -hmm. like Alan said I don't think this gets parked up like that in the winter, but mm -hmm. um, But then also as Alan said that first block on third street just north of bridge there having no parking in that stretch that would seem to really clean things there, up. I think yeah. the closer you get to those businesses yep. And to the school across the way there, it's right. it's a lot. So, yeah. um, you know, I could see no parking on both sides there, but I think just for the interest of simplicity, we'd cut the sign volume in half if it was just no parking this side of street. Right. Right. So, um, I guess I'll I'll make a motion that we um, amend the signage there um, to show no parking this side of street on the west side of the street, um, and then follow Allen's recommendation for Third Street from Lincoln to Humboldt with. Uh, or no, from Chicago to Bridge for no parking this side of street as well. So that would basically take out the entire west side, the whole length, right? I guess, well, I'm sorry. Oh, it's in Gary's district too, I guess. Gary, what are you hearing? Is well, I, I same think, thing or? I, I think this issue came up a while ago, and I think that's what I agree. I think that this is, um, you know, it's just kind of an Side, but I think some of those feed off of an alley, you know, so, there's, so there might, might be access. But I agree. I think that 
um, that this should be uh, the driveways on the west side of the street. Uh, I, I agree with your motion. I think that that's the way we should go. And I think that in conjunction with that, I think a, a yellow, because when the woodchucks are here in town, um, there is issues with off on street parking. And I think a lot of that comes with people not knowing where the where this driveway ends or begins, it it's becomes difficult. And I think that some yellow striping, perhaps in the beginning of the of the year, would would help that issue because the drivers would know where not to park. Um, but I agree with. You. Well, I think just for ease of use too. I don't think if we can avoid it, I don't think it makes sense to have a person have to pull out a calendar to figure out if they can park their car or not. So. Well, and it they I was told it had to do with night parking and it's just the opposite of what night parking is so nice. I was like that doesn't make any sense to me go ahead Alder, and I think further that the um, there's other off-street parking with the woodchucks I think that, that we're trying to gather some off-street parking so that you know the issues of on-street parking don't become such an issue with woodchuck games but I think that this is at least the beginning part that we should strive for at least this this remedy for that issue. Would you be okay with that, ma'am? Mm-hmm. Okay. That was what um, I had suggested all along was that they put, uh, first I had even suggested just a sign saying no parking four feet from my driveway because around the block on mobile, there's signs like that. I was like, how'd you guys get those signs? And they're like, we moved in and that was there. Okay, a motion has been made by any more, pardon yes. me, any more discussion on this? Yeah. No. I'd like to have one more comment. Um, okay, sure. So then your, your motion, Lisa, was for no parking on both sides of the street, right, between Chicago and Bridge? Correct. Okay. And then the west side, the rest of the way. And then I would, I, if you, I'd like to keep the no parking here to corner, up by, on the east side, up by East Wausau. Agreed, because that makes so, it really difficult yep, for people so to that, get around the corner. I'll include that in my motion. Okay, thank you. To retain that. And can I make a comment, too, that it should be yellow lined all the way up because... For some reason, people don't adhere to that sign. Maybe they could look at that separate from the motion as part of the pavement marking project for the for the year. Okay. Alder Denny, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, so uh, maybe I missed it back and forth here. They, are we talking the west side of 3rd all the way down or just those first two blocks? All the way down. All the way, Both okay. From Wausau, from Wausau Avenue to Bridge Street. Wausau Avenue to Bridge Street. Okay, got it. Yes, sir. Oh, so are you adding the no parking back to corner in that one part of 3rd Street by Chicago, Alan? Well, that wouldn't apply anymore, Cord, because we'd have no parking on that whole side. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. Any more discussion on this item? Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 And that passes unanimously. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Item three, discussion and possible action on parking restrictions on 700 block of Grant Street. Go ahead, Alan. Um, so the request was received from the owner of 720 um, the distillery um, to limit parking um, and um, he also had requested that that no parking be on the north side of that 700 block and also the resident at 708 which I spoke to um, also was in favor of the no even though it's on it was on her side of the street she's in favor of no parking in front of her um, the parcel there her garage is on the back and she found it difficult um, with her current situation with there's people parked in there. Um, so that was the request from 720 and 708 to have no parking on the north side. Um, but obviously it's, it's been this way for a long time with parking on both sides of the street with the, with the distillery and with the Hiawatha. So I, you know, I know the business is actually one of the businesses, 720 is one against it, but because I think they think they have plenty of parking, but Obviously, it would take away parking from the Hiawatha. It's just a, a comment that I have. That's a tough call because, yeah, you, there is businesses down there, and no, there is always cars lined up and down that street. 
Um, so I will take any further comments on this. Yes, Alder Rasmussen. Thank you. I have just one. Um, sometimes, and, and this, this neighborhood is, is a classic example, we had a similar situation near Bull Falls Brewery when they were having events and things. It's when they're parked on both sides or allowed to park on both sides, it's very difficult to get emergency apparatus in and out of there. Um, it's also difficult, um, like I said, for things like snow plowing and, and the garbage trucks to get through and whatever, depending on when they're parked there. And so if the business owner is actually requesting um, uh, restriction of parking on one side of the street and yet the other side would still remain parkable, I think that makes sense. So I'll make a motion that we approve um, the restriction of parking on the north side of Grant Street during in that block. Yes, Alder Dinney. Oh, I guess I could. I guess we need a second. Uh, so I'll second that. Okay. For okay. Thank you, Alder Gisman. And I do oh. have a question. Alder Dinney, go ahead. All right. So there's parking this this lot to the north of the old. Uh, of 720 is that owned by the 720 or is that street parking does that street come all the way through so going to the hiawatha could they park up in there the park street ends there where it, um basically where my arrow says requested no parking the, the street right away ends there so 720 owns that whole lot basically the, the street right away ends okay i believe there might be some i think there might be someone here to speak on it i believe oh if that's so i mean I just want to bring that to your attention. Come on up, sir. State your name and address, please. Uh, Dan Weber, uh, 720 Grand Street and 3824 North 14th Street. Um, so appreciate you um, assessing our situation and to speak on the comment of, of uh, where we're coming from is we have a lot of aggressive traffic that comes through what used to be St. Paul Street and people still continue to use this as a road. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I've inherited the situation of it not being a road. Uh, and with that, we've had issues with uh, excessive speed, um, no stopping, and um, traffic being backed up for not only our guests, but the Hiawatha guests. Um, <clears throat> I spoke to several of the re residents near me asking what their thoughts were being long-term there, as I also do own a rental on that road, and it is difficult for some of our renters uh, in this situation. Um, ultimately, we're leaning towards closing off the McCullen access to our property, um, you know, to help limit some of the traffics. So Grant Street would be the only entrance and exit to both of our facilities. Um, Hiawatha is in currently standing lease terms with us uh, for at least the next five to six years uh, uninterrupted. Um, so there should be no discrepancies on to what availability there is. Uh, there's a lot directly to the south of us owned by Sun Printing. Um, I've um, <clears throat> secured uh, agreements to uh, have that as auxiliary parking at no cost to us and the Hiawatha to make sure that, you know, that there's uh, accommodations for everyone. Um, so that's kind of where we're coming at with things. It's public safety. Um, it's going to cost us probably close to $100,000 to repave that lot in the next few years. And to have the greater municipality use it as a throughway um, is only detrimental to our investment. And so um, we know that it, it, it could create some confusion, um, but ultimately we believe it's in the best interest of, of the businesses and the, the occupants of that street. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Alder Hinky, did you want it? Yeah, I, I've gone down to timekeepers a couple times, and you have to be very polite <laughs> to get through there at times. Um, and there, that whole that whole lot to the north, I've parked in there before, and the lot to the south, I've parked down there before too. And yeah, I'm, I'm all for this. I guess you know, for the safety of the neighborhood, with the two businesses there. You know, by not having parking on one side of the street, you could not have to, you know, you could probably get two cars down that street going uh, east and west instead of getting halfway down that block and all of a sudden somebody come around the corner and, and you're duh. You know, so I, I guess I, I'm, I'm, I would go for this too. Any other comments? A question. Yes, I'll So St. Paul, uh, Paul doesn't street doesn't come down from 
um, from Scott Street North. Um, so that's not a thoroughfare anymore. It correct. It never. It never was. It was owned by 720. It was treated like a street, but it's not. There's no right of way there. Hmm. Okay. Right. People used it as a street, but I think we've since found out that there is no right of way in there. Our right of way ends on that right on the end of Grand Street. Do you want any more comments? Makes sense. Just about what I've experienced or what I've known from. Come up to the microphone, please, sir. So the information that we've been provided as the owners and going through a lot of this is um, there was discrepancies between the previous owner at 720 and the Hiawatha, and they had closed off that lot. Um, and there was a lot of misunderstanding because it was paved by the city. It was labeled by the city. It is a road on Google, on any advisory map that you go through. But there is, and again, we've had lengthy discussions um, but uh, the city has uh, been very firm on that uh, it is our property and our responsibility and that uh, it ends at uh, 710 Grant Street and then St. Paul goes from Scott to McCullen but then closes off at McCullen and that is where our 1.1 acre starts. So just, uh, <laughs> I, I just inherited it, I don't know. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, motion has been made and seconded to approve this. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And there's no opposed, so that passes unanimously. Item number four, discussion and possible action on an easement for 1100 Highland Boulevard. Go ahead, Alan. Sure, so inspections and uh, Bill Hebert from inspections and myself and city surveyor, uh, Dave Hempfner went out and there was a, um, as you can see this, um, I don't know what we want to call it, outdoor. Tea garden. Tea garden or it's, you know, this building was, was built and unfortunately, or it, it was placed on city right away. There's an old band that never used section of right away that you can see that is hashed on the map. And that's kind of where this little hut or building sits. So the owner of 1010 um, was not happy with the building, um, to be honest, and she was voicing her concern and does not like the building there. Um, so I guess, you know, what we had originally looked at was if this right of way is not going to be used, we could vacate the right of way. And then the, from our research, all that land would have reverted to 1100. So then this building would have been on 1100's property. However, um, in discussions with the owner of 1010, they would have objected to that vacation because then um, they would have just objected to the vacation. It wouldn't, the right of way would have never been vacated. So we felt it best why go down a road to vacate it when it's just going to be objected. Um, so the option is we in my mind, we give the owner of 1100, the city grants them an easement to keep this building in the right of way, um, or else Bill will have to give orders to have it removed. Thank you, Alan. Um, Alder Rasmussen, Thank do you, you have your thoughts? Um, well, we've had some situations like this before, and I, I think an easement makes sense. It's a small portion of the right of way total that's there. And the easement carries the caveat that the person would have to remove it at the city's request at their own expense if it becomes necessary. Um, we've done that a lot of times when people have put their landscaping and their sprinkler systems right to the curb and not left space for our right of way. And so, um, you know, the fact that this is there, obviously an investment's been made and from the photo it does blend with their property. Um, if we have no immediate public use for that, an, an easement makes sense. I'll make a motion to approve. We have a motion to approve the easement. Is there a second? Second by Alder Hinky. Um, I guess I'm 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 kind of torn on this because yeah, it, 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 there again, it, it looks like it's part of the structure, but uh, then if 
we start allowing people to put buildings and stuff up on city property, with, you know, we're kind of opening up a whole can of worms. And I'm not so sure I can, I can support this because you know, if somebody's going to put an easement up here or somebody's going to put a hut up here, uh, who's to say somebody else is going to put another hut up someplace else and, and so on. And, and I'm, I'm afraid that we could be uh, opening up a can of worms. I, I, if there's already one objection to it, um, I'm not so sure I could support it. Go ahead, Alder Hinky. Did they get a building permit for that? Um, no, they did not get a building permit for that. And I don't know if one was required for such a strike. I, I don't, I don't think they did. There was plans submitted, but then they were, um, but I don't think that actual building permit was granted. I, to your concern, Lou, I mean, I, I, I do understand your concern. I think. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, like Lisa said, we have allowed retaining walls and such to be placed in the right-of-way. Um, so if another case came up, it could be denied in another case. But there's always that. This is a, you know, every, I think every case is unique, so. I, I think that this is one of those things that uh, it sounds like it's neighbor against neighbor. You know, so, so how do we... <laughs> Who do we side with, you know? One person says, well, they built this thing. The other person says, I don't like it, you know? So go ahead, Alder, guess what, man. So is the, is the um, is that paved, that part that's hashtagged? No, it is all undeveloped. Basically, if you look at the first picture, and if you look straight to the, that would be straight north, there's basically trees and grass. You'd never know there was right away there. There's a pole there, but... If you didn't have a map in front of you showing the right of way, you wouldn't know that that's a city. It's just overgrown with trees and shrubs and grass. The people treat it basically as their backyards. But if if we would vacate, then when when do we split the two? When we split it between the two, when one could necessarily go to both, when to go to both property owners down the middle? No, in my it's my understanding in this case that all the right of way for that property was given by the 1100 so all the property would go back to 1100 that is the case in some cases but uh, according to our research by our by our surveyor all the property would go to 1100 it wouldn't be split like in this case so if you look at that map there there's all you see the notation for 10 12 everest boulevard um there's a small that i mean so basically there is not a road all the way up to adam street it's basically just grass and trees Adam Street ends, and then there's no road that turns south. It's just there. The, the right of way is actually there, but there's no road built. So it's all grassy area? Yes, so you, it's just grass. If and you go back there, you wouldn't even know. Correct. It's grass and trees. Well, that's probably why it got built where it did. They didn't know either. Right? I mean. I don't. I can't speak to whether they knew or not. I. <laughs> Alder Dinny. Uh, just the appearance. I mean, if you were ten ten, it certainly looks like it's in your backyard. Who's who's so that hashed line? Who actually owns the property right now? That's a city property. City. Okay. Right, and that's why we're here. It's a city right away, city owned property. So, if they want to keep that in there, the city would give them an easement to keep that in the right away. There would be, like you said, there would be an easement written that. They would be responsible to take it down because we do have sewer um, in that area. If we ever were going to construct a road, which I don't foresee, but if we ever were or we needed to maintain the, they would be responsible to remove it. And it would also be a hold, har hold harmless agreement to the city mm -hmm. that if something were to happen on that, we wouldn't be, the city wouldn't get sued or be a hold harmless agreement, which is typical for these kind of, if we give an easement in the right of way. But but 1010 doesn't have any, I mean, their lot line is to the um, to the east there, so they have no jurisdiction really within this within this space either. So basically it's up to the city to decide what it wants to do with that little block of land, right? Because 1010 doesn't, um, their lot line is where it is.
It is my understanding that where Adam Street comes there, there, this is another, where Adam Street ends, this is another street that goes up to 1012 and 1010, or is that a driveway, or? There's no street there. It's just grassy area. Oh, yeah, that's it's just grassy area. Oh, I see. I see, so they have access here from from Everest Boulevard to Correct. their property. Yep. So this, this, uh, this um, tea garden is actually in, uh, 1012s in 1010s backyard, so to speak. So it would be on the side, like the side yard of 1012, right? And then it's in the, the backyard of 1010, not on their property in the city right of way. Correct. Has there been a motion made on this? I don't recall. I did. Made a motion to approve the easement. Any more discussion on this? Is I have just one more question, I guess. Would it be, I, I don't know. Have, have you been out to look at this? Obviously you have. I mean, we've yes. got pictures here. Mm -hmm. And is it, 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 it's definitely not an eyesore, and I don't see it as detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, gosh. Okay, we have a motion on the floor and seconded. Mm -hmm. All in favor of approving the motion signify by saying aye. 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 That passes unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to item five, discussion and possible action of sale of portion of 1300 Cleveland Avenue. And Eric, this is yours. Yeah. Um. Since I put this together, I've learned that th this is the strip of land along West Thomas Street uh, that's in front or just on the north side of St. Vincent de Paul. Um, that actually has its own address. It's 123 Thomas Street. And so um, so that's really what we'll refer to it as, I guess. But St. Vincent de Paul, as you can see in, in my memo, has has asked if the city is willing to sell that piece of property. They have a sign there um, on the northeast corner in, in that hashed area. And I've kind of outlaid the process that the city uses to um, to sell property. And so, uh, you know, the first step is coming to CISM and to see if they're, uh, if the committee at all is, is okay with uh, potentially selling this piece of property. Mm -hmm. So the size and shape of the property is reminiscent of a remnant parcel. It's oddly shaped. You know, it does square off the other property um, if we were to sell it. Um, so since it has its own address, that wouldn't require us to resurvey and replat 1300, would it? Uh, it would go to, well, 131 Thomas Street, which is St. Vincent de Paul. 1300 Cleveland is actually to the south. Okay. And and so, um, yeah, it's it's um, the address is there. So, I I don't know Lisa exactly how. I'm assuming that that piece then uh, may be combined with 131. I w I would assume that that's what would happen. Okay. 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 And so this is just the piece that their sign is on. Um, yep. And it does eliminate some ambiguity with the shape of the parcel. I mean, it does square off the other parcel. And take get that curve out of there that looks like a remnant of Cleveland. Um, and so your outline of our process says that we would then, like we do with any remnant parcel, basically offer it up to the individual departments if they have no public use for it, then put it up for bid. That's correct. With a minimum bid of seven fifty. That that's my recommendation. You could set that at whatever you'd like. We've set it at five hundred in the past for other, you know, remnant pieces that we've sold to. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I just felt 750 was reasonable based on the square footage and, uh, and, you know, there's not a lot of use for that property anyway out there. So. Well, and a technical question because on our agenda and in our agenda item, we didn't reference the Thomas Street address that the piece actually has. We referenced Cleveland Ave. So right. do we have to hold it and act on it next month with the correct address? Because, I mean, the way the agenda reads now, it, it reads like we're splitting off part of 1300, which could be confusing to the public. 
I, yeah, that's that's true. Um, it there isn't any necessary urgency for okay. for us to pursue this. So if to be cleaner, I would support okay. it, but I think that we should reword it with the right street address and then maybe look at it next time if that works for everybody, because this really could get people confused. I would have to agree with that. Alder Killian, this is in your district. Do you have anything to, to say on this? or? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would uh, agree with uh, Alder Rasmussen that uh, having uh, the proper address may simply be less confusing for the public. Uh, in the future, I might have questions just about if there's any differing zoning between those two parcels, how they would be married or resolved, but I think those are questions for another time. Thank you. Okay. Okay, motion by Alder Rasmussen to table this until we get the proper address. Well, I don't think we even have to table. I think if we just agree we want to defer action, they could just bring it back next time. If we all agree by consensus that we want to wait, then they could just put it on for next month, just like a delay. You wouldn't have to okay. vote to table it if is everyone nodding. They're okay with waiting a month. Everybody okay with everyone waiting? Nodding. waiting nodding. I'll nod. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay. We'll defer this to next month then. Thank There's you. one in every crowd, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Item six, discussion and possible action on authorizing downtown snow and ice removal. Just um, um, pretty straightforward. This when we hire out the downtown snow removal and we assess back out. So this resolution would just be approving those assessments or you know based on the actual cost. I, I guess my question is, you know, as I look at the past, um, you know, uh, dollar amount per foot, why is there such a, a variant in, in, in all the years? I mean, from 207 to 8, 218, it went from $9 and 6 to $11 and then down to 7 down to 5 and now up to 8 uh, um, I don't understand how you come up with those figures. And could you explain that to us, please? Well, the nature. <laughs> it depends on how much it likes to snow. Well, okay, it's so going to depend on the bid price we get to, because we'll we'll bid it out again this year. Oh, so, okay. if the bid price goes up, you know, which we're assuming the the bid price will go up this year, the hourly rate, and then the amount of snow we get. So, it's how many times they have to clear it. Okay. So the more they have to clear it, the higher the rate goes. Alder Asmussen. Uh, that was my question. Is it's dependent upon the amount of work, and either way, the bid district pays for it, right? So they get assessed for it, don't they? Yes. In, yeah. So that so we bid it out uh, per hour. Yep. And then at the end of the year, um, we convert it to linear feet of sidewalk that's cleared and, and maintained. That's why the the costs go okay. the the way that they are. But for us to try to establish that they come out at a half inch of snow or one inch of snow per linear foot of sidewalk, mm -hmm. it's easier for us to bid it out as an hourly rate. Um, you know, for comparison, and then the businesses, we convert it at the end of the year then for per linear foot of sidewalk okay. based on that total cost, if that makes sense. It does, thanks. Okay, yeah. Move to approve by Alder Gisselman. Second. I'll second. Who's the second? I'll second. Alder Hinkey. Okay, move to approve item six has been Approve uh, motion made and seconded. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And that motion passes. Okay. Discussion and possible action item seven. Discussion and possible action on establishing assessment rates for 2023 construction projects. This one is Alan as well. Yes. So it's been the city policy to assess out 60% of the cost of the roadway, which would include the curb and gutter, um, the pavement, the base course, and the excavation of the street. That's not including the storm sewer um, or the uh, water and sewer, that's paid separate. So in the past, you know, that rate has been, but right now for this year, it's $42 a foot. It hasn't been raised in a couple years. When we look at the current cost to build a road if if we want if this committee wants to keep assessing 60 percent of the roadway out 
my calculations were that we'd have to raise the assessable per foot to hundred dollars per foot so um, I just wanted to bring that forward that you know just because it was a policy of 60 percent that was a it was kind of a decision made by SISM years ago there's nothing set in stone there's no um, code I mean you don't have to assess 60 percent that was just kind of what that number was always based upon so if we stay at the $42 per foot, we're assessing about 25% of the cost to build the road. That's just if you, you know, but I just wanted to bring all those numbers forward so that you had the, all the information you need to make a decision whether you want to raise the rate or keep it the same. Alder Rasmussen. Thank you. Um, first, let me say that I think 100 all in one step is impossible. Um, there's a lot of city lots that, I mean, just on average, if you have a 100-foot city lot, that takes your assessment for the same street from 4200 to $10,000, like overnight. People can't afford that. Even if you put them on the five-year plan, it, with the economy being what it is, it's just not feasible. I feel like it's a good goal for us to have to maybe get back to the 60% at some point, but I feel like we, at, at best, we have to step into it. We can't just take you know, one huge escalation like that. Um, I feel like if we wanted to raise it, you know, maybe we should consider something like $55 and not 100. And then, you know, each year we can certainly look at, you know, where we're at economically and where we're at with costs because right now the bids we're getting were incredibly high. If some of the supply issues start to mitigate in the coming years, maybe we won't see that things are so bad. It may stay high. We don't know that. But if it does, we'll have to deal with that each year but you know then i think each year we should make a decision if we want to stay or get a little closer to the 60 but i don't think that we can shoot that all the way to 100 this year that's just too much for people i'm in full agreement thank you alder rasmussen Yeah, I'm not recommending 100. I just wanted to bring all the facts forward. I think you're right. In my opinion, it is a big jump. You How know. does the committee feel about 55? I mean, you know, that would on the same 100 foot lot, you'd go from 42 to 55, but you wouldn't be at 10,000. Where where do you guys feel about that? Just to pick a midpoint. Alder Gisman. Well, I would agree. I think somewhere in there. So. If if that happy medium is 55, then I think we should go with that. I think that's a good suggestion. I think there's a need for some kind of raise, whatever that will be. And other persons, Rasmussen's idea, I think, is sufficient. So I, um, I don't know if that was a motion, it wasn't, but, go ahead. but I will make that motion then to uh, raise the assessment to 40 to from 42 to 55 dollars a foot. Right. That's correct. Okay. Okay, a motion has been made to uh, item number seven to raise the uh, accessible uh, foot from $42 per foot to $55 per foot. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And none opposed. That passes unanimously. Item eight, uh, discussion and possible action on a transportation plat for Project 6999-09-02 Stewart Avenue, 72nd Avenue to 48th Avenue. Uh, we talked about this already, but go ahead, Alan. Sure. This is a like a like the item states a transportation project plat put together by EMCS, who is our consultant on the project. Um, during their design, they have identified. Um, easements or temporary limited easements permanent limited easements and a few small um, permanent um, right-of-way acquisitions that need to be done to complete the project so um, approving this plat um, would move it on to council to approve and then it would give the consultant the that would be recorded and would give the consultant the uh, the real estate consultant to go out and start purchasing these properties the easements or the fees Thank you, Alan. My, my question would be to you as I, I drive that, I drove that road today, and um, which uh, which side would get would would get hit the most? Uh, would it be the north side or the south side, or are they taking four feet off each side, or 
um, because I know, uh, like, the, just to give you an example, uh, um, business out there, Westside Auto has, uh, you know, they're pretty close to the road out there, and, and you know, if you're going to be taking 10 or 15 feet off that side of the street there, that, that would really hurt their business. And there's other businesses that, that go uh, further uh, west from that are that are in pretty much the same predicament from Westside Auto. So that's that's my concern. Yeah. There's not a lot of um, permanent takings. I mean, we'd have to look address by address, but most, you know, more of the significant ones are on the far west end, which would be um, the crime labs out there, and then there's the uh, uh, FedEx building, and that's basically to, to construct some ditches behind this, so it's really not a um, significant taking. They're, they're further off, the, but it's just to construct some ditches back there for some stormwater. Um, and there's some temperature limited easement, so there's it's not a huge taking on any of the parcels. And by not a huge parcel, not a huge take, can you describe what five, what's not a huge take? Five feet, ten feet. Uh, I mean, like for instance, you know, there's temporary living easements, you know, a couple feet behind towards the, to, um, for the length of the lot. So um, we'd have to get specific on each one, to be honest with you. But we aren't taking any parcels in full. Um, there's no okay, so yeah, there's no, no there's no there's no relocations. There's houses that, no. that have to relocate. So no, not no. We have we have enough right away out there to construct the road um, without taking any businesses or relocating anybody. These would be uh, simply simply some some strip takings. Alder Rasmussen, did you I have just your hand a question? Up? So with with regard to temporary limited easements, those are made to. Um, either access the property during construction or restore it after, but then the people get it back. They might get a nominal sum for their inconvenience, but you know, even with the strip takings, if we approve this, the real estate firm would get to go out and negotiate with those property owners. So if there's permanent easement necessary, there's a price tag for that, and they negotiate with the person for a fair price. And if it is an unnecessary um, encumbrance upon their business, that would certainly be fleshed out then, right? So then they could work with you know, maybe the opposite side of the street or try to reduce what they need through the negotiation, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, most of these will be on a nominant um, payment parcel report be okay. be because they're they're small. Um, but there there's a couple that, uh, you know, will probably be restoring some blacktop and stuff like that. So those would um, cost some more. Uh, and some smaller pieces of actually permanent takings, just as Alan said, for stormwater and, and things like that. But all of those would come, you know, a, as we've done before, uh, those offers would be presented to finance. Finance would approve making those offers, and then if there's any negotiation, those costs would come back and be discussed at finance and until a price is agreed to, yeah. Okay, I'll move to approve then. Okay, we have a motion and a second, but go ahead, Alder Gisler. So then, uh, and maybe the planner can, and I have a hard time reading these maps, but w what about bicycle and are there sidewalks or what? what's the design with regard to off, is it off street bicycling or because right, off, right on the other side of 72nd, the city is involving with some trails for that business campus and here we are on the east side of 72nd are we thinking of that at all or how are we looking at trails i'll use the word trail um with regard to by sidewalks or bicycle trails are is that part of this plan yes the current design has um, bicycle lanes on both sides of the road plus we have a 10-foot um multi-use path on the north side the entire length of the project right so it'll be on street and off street bicycling and pedestrian thank you and i, I just want to make if you if you if you notice too that <clears throat> in working with this some of these parcels are in the town of Statine. um so what you'd be approving if you approve the plat would be the only the parcels within the city of wausau the parcels in the town of Statine, we have um, been working, I just, we had a conference call with Statine this week, so they're taking their parcels to their town board too to approve 
the same plat, but for their parcels. So just want to make clear that you would only be approving the parcels in the city of Wausau, because that parcel boundary kind of is meanders. meanders through there. That's a good word. Okay, a motion has been made for agenda no, item number. No, no, oh, oh no, yes, sorry. I'm sorry. No, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Alder Hinky. Uh, the only lines I really see crossing would be that temporary one. Is that Whiskey River on the corner of Stewart and Fifty Six? That won't go up that. It won't go up that far. Is that building in the right spot? We, well, um, we we will be. Um, there will be some impact to the Whiskey River at oh. uh, 48th. Um, there'll be. I mean. To, to right now, their, a lot of their parking is in the right of way. So when we put curb and gutter in there, that right, that parking is going to be impacted. Um, so that one of the part, that is one of the parcels where we will be getting some, uh, some fee and some TLE. So we're going to fix that corner once and for all. Then, <clears throat> yes, there'll be curb and gutter there. There'll be a, a, a defined driveway off onto uh, Stewart. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, uh, motion has been made on agenda item eight for to approving the project plat for Stewart Avenue and 72nd Avenue to 48th Avenue. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None opposed, that passes unanimously. Item number nine, discussion and possible action on revised State Municipal Agreement for Business Campus Trail, 72nd Avenue. And TJ has this one, so. <clears throat> so this is to um, update the SMA, the State Municipal Agreement, due to a change in scope. Uh, we're shortening this project uh, due to the price that it came in at. I sort of gave out a layout or a time frame of uh, how this project progressed. Uh, so we bid it out earlier this year and it came in at roughly $3 million, which was far over budget. So we looked at ways that we could possibly um, do some cost savings, and that was, one, to reduce the scope, remove the portion of the project south of Stewart that went to uh, Packer Drive. And then the other one was to change the um, construction dates, because this year, um, you know, it was a very busy year, and a lot of contractors um, just saw the time frame to build it and um, did not even submit a bid. We only had one bidder. So uh, with this SMA, we're going to um, just change the project limits and then we're going to be bidding this project out uh, starting next Tuesday for construction next year. But this state municipal agreement update is just to change the um, scope of the project. Okay. Thank you, TJ. Any discussion on this item? So ahead, the south Alder portion, the, so the south portion that got deleted, um, let's not lose sight of that though, because if we can construct that in a future phase, especially if there's grant dollars available, we should still not let that go completely. Yes, and I did clarify with um, DOT that it would still be TAP grant eligible. Oh, that was my next question. Thank you. Any further discussion? Any? Motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Motion is made the to revision. approve uh, item number nine, agenda item nine. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second by Alder Dinney. Okay, and, uh, we have a motion and a second for uh, the municipal agreement for the business campus trail on 72nd Avenue. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And there's none opposed to that, so we move on to item number 10. Discussion and possible action to consider site selection for new fleet facility, fleet maintenance facility. Eric. Yeah, so um, we've been working with our consultant, uh, Barrientos, and looking through all of the sites citywide that we have looked at. Um, I have a, a in the staff report kind of outlines uh, what we've done for rankings and sites that were still uh, seem to be viable for uh, a new facility. 
having internal discussions with staff like the the three sites on county z and x um that one site anyway isn't actually connected to the city uh um the roadway or county x is obviously county highway it's not a city road so um i think we would have to actually take some of the county highway in order to get that property annexed so i don't know that that's a um is going to turn out to be a specifically viable option. Uh, the other piece on County Z uh, doesn't seem to be um, ideal for location, and um, I did not get a response back from uh, the owner on that property. Um, and the property at County N um, didn't quite rank or score as high, uh, but it it still possibly could be I haven't spoken with the owner on that one either um, then over what was that was that Tuesday that we went yes. and, and we toured the West Street the old ironwork site um, the uh, the office space there it has been fully remodeled seems to be a viable building to keep there uh, as far as office space a lot of the large storage buildings do not they're large and there's a lot of space in them but um uh, just the condition of them and um, i don't know that it would really be very viable for our use so they would likely have to be raised um there is a like a salt sand storage uh building on that site that could possibly be reused as well for us to store some sand on uh, so that could potentially be salvaged as well. Um, and then we would, with the raise of the buildings, try to, uh, it seems like it has really good access to, uh, to West Street and also South 10th Avenue uh, for easy in and out with large vehicles and trucks as well. So there seemed to be uh, a pretty good opportunity there. Uh, we spoke with, you know, the owner, he took us around uh, one of one thing that I would like to note on that property, um, a couple of things actually. One is is they did have a phase one and phase two environmental done on it before it was, and I am uh, the owner is going to send those over to me. They were done by REI uh, when that property was purchased a few years ago. So we'll look through those, but there may be some additional due diligence that we would have to do if this becomes a, a site to look at further. Um, there also, some of those buildings are being leased out by the owner to other businesses, uh, which I, it sounded like that in order, if this were to be purchased by the city, that those leases would probably also have to be uh, bought out. Um, relocation and stuff would be a potential other expense. Not sure how that would play out. Um, um, one other thing that, that other, that other, um, Golf cart building that. Yep. That the one you. are right. You we could probably hold on to as well or not raise I should say. Yeah, depending on how our our facility would fit on there, that that's a potential building that could could be reused as well. You're right, Lou. Yep. Thank you. Um, further discussion on this, uh, Alder Rasmussen. Thank you. Um, I, I'm. I guess I would say encouraged by what I heard about the. Um, uh, West Street site uh, as far as the ironworks uh, if there's property there that's useful um, Obviously acquisition cost and relocation costs would be a concern. We'd have to put a number to that mm -hmm. um, you know and it first let me say it's not my goal to stir up a hornet's nest here, but um, I I have a problem with our meeting packets for today. Um, this item was on for last month We held action on it because we didn't have the entire committee with us but Barriento studied multiple sites and before we got the information the scoring and the ranking and and the decision on a site facility is for all of us to make and for the entire council to make and so I guess I will just say I'm disappointed in the meeting packet because prior to the packet being circulated the staff was asked to revise the results of the study and eliminate a location from our view and from the public's view and, you know, I, and it's, it's, I'm not to be personal, Mr. Chairman, but I will say that 
I don't feel it's appropriate for the chairman of any committee to restrict the flow of information into the committee. The committee deserves and is entitled to complete and accurate information because we can't make an educated decision without it. And even if we disagree, we have to let that discussion happen and we have to rely on the rest of us to make the right decisions. And so Barrientos, you saw in your packet, Barrientos also studied 1300 Cleveland Avenue. And nobody wants to talk about 1300 Cleveland Avenue. And we did agree with the neighborhood that we want to clean it up to residential standard. And I still agree with that. I want that to happen. But even after that cleanup happens, someone needs to show me at Pardon that me, hold point. on, hold on, Alder Rasmussen. Um, first of all, the city council voted to to, no, the no. city council voted to rezone the property. Rezone the property. The city council residential. did not and vote to restrict. And furthermore, let me finish. No, let, okay, let me go finish. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, upon seeing the meeting packets and knowing that the spreadsheet had been modified, I went back to the staff and I asked for the right information and I got it. And everyone needs to know, including the public, that the 1300 Cleveland Avenue site is not only the highest scoring site. It's $2 million cheaper. And, you know, I'm sorry if, if we're going to fight about this, but I'm handing it out. So if someone Alder wants Killian. to pass one of those to Chad, the, com the committee deserves accurate information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll wait till Alder Rasmussen passes those out because they're quite important. I've got one, but thank you. Yeah, I'll take one of those, too, just... Great, and uh, I've got uh, a scoring sheet that I'm going to pass out as well that was in uh, your packet a couple months ago, and you'll find this uh, equally important. I think you'll find this dovetails quite well with uh, what Alder Rasmussen was just stating. So uh, let's start by looking at and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a fighting guy. Uh, I know uh, the word fight was brought up, but I'd uh, like to look at this uh, objectively and factually. That's kind of my style. Uh, there are a lot of opinions out there, but there's only one set of facts. So uh, let's look at the history of uh, 1300 Cleveland in terms of uh, this study. So on September 14th, uh, 2021, uh, there was a vote uh, on this item for this particular particular study. Now I uh, actually have the clips of the key statements in my pocket on a USB that were from the mayor and the city attorney. I'll summarize them if you'd like to hear them uh, say those statements themselves. Uh, it's only 90 seconds and we can fire that up. Uh, but essentially uh, what happened is that had been agendized initially as a funds transfer. I think it had been mistakenly listed as a budget modification, but the city attorney notified us that really it was a funds transfer. And uh, you may have heard of something called a controlling part of a resolution. Right, so uh, be it resolved. So there had been some foreknowledge, apparently, of an amendment to that resolution uh, because of uh, concerns from multiple, if not the majority, of members on the council at that time about Cleveland Avenue, the status of its environmental fitness or lack thereof, uh, as well as a heavy amount of public feedback from the neighborhood about its own residential, obviously, so concerns about rezoning that. Uh, so what the city attorney said, and again, watch it now or watch it at home on public access, uh, was essentially that she captured the uh, intent of the, uh, the amendment to the resolution uh, in new be it resolved language. And as the city attorney states on that public access video, that was intended to disallow 
1300 Cleveland Avenue uh, from being part of this study or at all. Uh, and uh, Alder Larson, uh, now chair of this committee, uh, had asked uh, seconds prior to voting, also on the video if you want to watch it or whatever uh, pleases you, uh, he asked for clarification on what the amendment meant and if the funds would still be applied to the study. And the mayor said prior to the vote, and I've got the quote here, the study will happen without Cleveland Avenue as an option. So it was very clear uh, at the time and uh, thereafter that uh, this was not just about the fact that the city made a massive, profound zoning map error, which had been corrected, uh, thank goodness for the community. Uh, but no, the majority of the council had voted. It's on tape. Uh, there's not much to fight about because those are the facts. So uh, really, that's that. But uh, in terms of what I just passed out uh, to the committee, the scoring is quite important and I thought it was inappropriate to put the score for Cleveland Avenue in the packet a couple months ago because of what I just described and there had been a specific directive from the council as described by the city attorney to, to remove it. But thankfully there's a silver lining and that is when you put a score together, make sure your numbers are correct. So these numbers are not correct. I'm a little stunned that there were multiple department heads involved in this scoring as well as a consulting firm and we still got incorrect numbers. So let me be more specific. On the Cleveland Avenue score, it, it is listed at 27, which would place it in a tie for the highest. But once we align these scores with the facts, which I also have and can pass out to you if you'd like, it actually ranks uh, quite low on the list, uh, much lower than several sites. So let's look at one uh, item scored, quote, existing zoning conformance. That's marked at three on Cleveland, which uh, signifies best. That should actually be ranked as one, poor, because that is currently zoned residential, and that would require, if not rezoning, I certainly hope they wouldn't try to pull a fast one and not do rezoning, but it would have to be zoned industrial again. So no, there is no current uh, zoning conformance in terms of its residential and it would need to be industrial. The second element is environmental justice score and I copied Mr. Lindman on a chair to bar, uh, and the chair on an email to Barrientos yesterday. I hope that's passed out to the entire committee and staff. Uh, the score of two, which would indicate a new neutral impact on underserved communities uh, for Cleveland Avenue, uh, that's an erroneous score. And I, I don't know intent, so all I can tell you is it's incorrect. I'm not saying it's baked. Maybe it's baked. It doesn't really matter. It's wrong. Uh, so here's the EPA EJ screen report. And, uh, you know, uh, some of this, is, and may I have a few minutes? This is quite complex, you, you may, Mr. You Chair. May. Uh, thank you. Continue. So, yes. So, you know, when you're doing EJ uh, uh, assessments like this, really you want to get the highest resolution data possible, and uh, that would be the census block group. I've repeatedly requested uh, from staff and, and now the consultant to have all the addresses of these sites co so I could run it through a legitimate screening tool. To date, I've not been given that courtesy, but I did run Cleveland Avenue, and so you'll see on the key metrics when we look at income status and people of color, that this particular census group for Cleveland Avenue is 53% people of color, I believe 46% low income. It's got an, a linguistic isolation rate of 16%. And then looking at other metrics like the percentage of children under five, you'll see that it's at 12%, which is actually twice the state average or the EPA region average. I could go on at length using other types of vulnerability reports from the CDC and others, and they all indicate the same thing, which would be there would be a massive impact on an EJ community. So, uh, 
you know, is that debatable? Perhaps a little. I mean, we could debate whether the grass is green or pink, but it would be a rather unnecessary debate. The fact of the matter, that score should be one, or they should create a zero and put that there. So when you actually put factual numbers on the scoring report, uh, I am sure what Alder Rasmussen stated, she believed to be true, but it's actually not true. When you unbake the numbers, what you see is it actually does not have a good score. So that was the data component. I wasn't planning on having to negate that data set. But I'd, I'd also say, uh, yeah, it was crystal clear uh, that it was intended to take that site uh, out of this facility study. Uh, also, exactly. we have a lot of feedback and it would be, I'd like it noted for the record in minutes, that it would be highly irregular to now uh, pull that out and try to reinsert it again, uh, particularly uh, when that would stand in stark contrast to how we've treated different neighborhoods with different demographic compositions. So thank you for your time. Um, would anybody like to see that clip? So I have a follow-up question. So then Barrientos went forward with the study. The product they produced includes Cleveland Avenue, and it includes it with a score. Except for the fact that we already, uh, um, okay. a, as a committee, told the, the city to, to go ahead with the West Street address. We encourage them to pursue those alternatives to know what the numbers were, but we haven't settled on any location. So... I feel like if, we're, if we contract for a study and we spend the public's money on a study, the study should be provided to the committee the way it came in. And I think it's wrong to, for the staff or to ask the staff to put them in a position to have to modify the results of a study that, was, that the public paid for. I mean, if it includes, if this chart includes Cleveland Avenue and we don't like that fact, we can talk about the fact that we don't like that but we don't just shield from view what it said. That's what, that was my whole problem with this, is that when I opened up the meeting packet and it says, well, some of this information wasn't included, well, okay, it wasn't included, so you read the spreadsheet, well, they deleted an entire column of a spreadsheet. I just feel like we need complete information, the public needs complete information. If we feel that these numbers that Barrientos came up with for Cleveland are skewed, or inaccurate, or we don't like the way stuff got scored, then we need to maybe fix that and make sure that we do the same. Maybe the EJ screen should be also done on the existing DPW site, which turned out to be one of the lowest scoring properties in the exact same neighborhood. But, you know, I just feel that we have to be honest with ourselves and with the public and the council. If the council still hates the idea, fine. But know that when the council makes a decision, whether it's zoning, you know, whatever it is. The council can do and undo any decision it chooses. So let's say this whole thing gets fleshed out and Cleveland Avenue gets cleaned up to residential standards, which we all agreed we wanted because we wanted it cleaned up to the best possible level. And then we decide that maybe we want to still look at the idea of on this super clean parcel, not, make, not building a house on it, what if we want to put the fleet facility on it? Well, the city still owns it. And as the owner, it could rezone the property legally any time it wants. It may not want to, but it has the option to. And if the council decided you know, a year ago that it didn't want that site to be in the running anymore, upon receipt of new information or site cleanup or costs of other facilities, the council also could decide to do a 180 and re-add that site back in the mix because it has the option to consider any land use it wants on property it owns. Maybe the rest of us or all of us would decide it's a horrible idea, but we have to be given the option and we have to be given the information. And so feeling like we were only getting 80% of a study we paid for, I was pretty unhappy with our packets. Now, if Cleveland Avenue's numbers aren't right, then we need to true them up. But that's a discussion for us to have here. And I just felt as a committee member, really put off by the packet when it tells me right in the packet there's information I can't have, that I can't see. And so when I went back to the staff and said, you know, hey, where is this? Like, what did you get from Barrientos? And I'm given a different spreadsheet. Super upsetting to me. That's just where I'm coming from. So I just think we should give all of it consideration and, and make an educated decision 
And I don't think it's right for us to assume that we won't make the right decision. Even if it was left in the study and in the packets, we all may have walked right over it. But don't take the information from us before we even get it. That's my point. Thank you. The fact remains, Alder Rasmussen, is that 1300 Cleveland Avenue has been off the table. Eric has said more than one city council meeting, 1300 Cleveland Avenue is off the table. And until it's cleaned up to re you know, residential standards, it's off the table. I mean, and, and Alder, perhaps you would like to play that that 90 minute the, the clip that you have? Oh, uh, uh, if the committee I, likes, or watch I, it online I, and I play mean, it. I uh, mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's it, off the table, and so, until it's cleaned up, it's it's off the table. And I, you know, I it, heard there was a, oh, pardon me, Mr. Go Chair. ahead, go ahead, Alder Killian. I had heard there was a follow-up question coming. I'm, I'm not sure it came, but I'll tell you that on September 14th, 2021, uh, with a summary given by both the city attorney and the mayor, uh, it was known through the vote of the council that the directive was to take this out of the study. And uh, I can also uh, say that I'd be concerned. There's also municipal code which states that to knowingly exceed one's authority uh, is uh, problematic. So I would go and revisit the September uh, 14th, 2021 meeting, uh, see what the council voted on. And also that is not uh, universally true. The city can do uh, just whatever it likes. Uh, there are other issues as a, as a recipient into federal funding, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we're in compliance uh, and there is not a disparate impact, that we are not intentionally or unintentionally uh, violating Title VI and a whole host of other criteria and rules. So, uh, you know, in 2012, the DOT and Highway Administration sent a letter to Mayor Tipple uh, informing him that the city violated the Uniform Act and the rights of residents in that same census block group, and I would just uh, be very uh, cautious that you're, you're not approaching uh, the same type of problem again. And lastly, I will be holding a public information uh, session in October uh, for the entire city, hopefully jointly with District 10 and Alder Larson. And I only had uh, three, well, I had a few minutes to set the record straight on facts tonight, but I assure you uh, after 60 minutes or so at that information meeting, uh, it should be even more uh, crystal clear. So thank you. Thank you, Alder Killian. So then, just a follow-up. So then, how did Cleveland Avenue remain in the study? Um, I was my understanding that Cleveland Avenue was under study before we even approved a study. Is that, uh, how did we end up? Cleve when we first began, this was back in 2018, and Cleveland Avenue was part of that review. Um, okay. Since, since the city council had made the statement that they did not want Cleveland Avenue looked at anymore, Staff has not put any more resources into looking at that site. But it is part of the original um, proposals that had come from Barrientos, and the information was paid for by taxpayer money to look at that um, back in 18 and 19. And so that information has followed this report since then. Um, and in 21, when the city council had said that they did not want staff looking at that site any further we haven't and when SISM said they wanted us to look at West Street site that's what we've been focused on but the information that was prepared on 1300 Cleveland prior to the September 21st that has been included in all of the reports going forward and the reality is is that the information that's provided still shows that Cleveland Avenue is a viable site now, whether the council doesn't want it, they don't want to look at it anymore, that's fine. But from an engineering standpoint, in, in our standpoint, what we have looked at in the past, it shows it's a viable site. And your work product is incorrect quantitatively, and I'm stunned that uh, with a multi-million dollar project, we can't get some numerical scores correct. Yeah, and I think actually, Tom, I think what that goes back to is the fact that those scores were probably prepared prior to the rezoning. And because we haven't really looked at that site again, you're probably right. We should go back and make sure those are correct. But that's just proof that we have not gone back and done something outside of our authority or anything like that. And I, and I take offense to the accusation. And so if you have an issue 
with the information that's coming out, please feel free to talk to me anytime. But the information that we have, I will present to committees. If the chairman asks me to take something off, I absolutely will because he or she has the authority to do that. But I think that everybody should be aware that if information isn't presented, why it is not being presented. And to, to that last point, that's also incorrect. Uh, the row of the EJ score was added since then, uh, a numerical value the of EJ. two. The that's, EJ is. That's and correct. we can talk about that score, whether it's two or one, Tom. And, and I think that, um, you know, we, we could change that, we could have that discussion, that's fine. But the zoning question, I believe, was done before. Yes, but the yep. additional row was added after, which again negates your prior point. Thank again, you. that's that's was added after, and we can debate that, Tom. Yes, I'll so, Yeah, I've got a, a question. Uh, so, I, to Lisa's point, it, it, it seems then that this column should have been left in, and then a footnote saying this this has been eliminated from consideration. I mean, what the 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 other spreadsheet that Alder Killian passed around had several other listed. I think Westwood was one. The, I don't know. There were several others. Uh, those are now gone, correct? Right. And and I would also say that the, the Cleveland say in the report itself, and I didn't attach the report this time, but in the report itself it has notes on each of those sites, uh, why they were in 1300 Cleveland in the actual report. It also makes mention that the city council had asked us not to pursue that site any, you know, put any more time or effort into that site. But those other sites are, uh, have determined to be not, not viable just because they're not willing to be sold or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Alder Gisselman. Thank you. Uh, I would like to get back to West Street. I think mm -hmm. that that was a, a good tour. Um, I'm not sure, you know, with regard to the rate, you know, so what is the facility, what kind of facility would we need, for instance, in square foot or whatever? Because do, would all of the property have to be raised or, or for instance, that far west big building or what everything within the confines of that acreage uh, have to be raised or can some of that be saved or does the new fleet facility need basically all that space? Yes, yeah, so on the, on the southeast corner there's an office uh, right. building right. And, and that seems to be in, in good shape right. and, and viable depending on how the site lays out. The large buildings that run east-west and then north-south on you know east west on the south side of the property and then north south on the west side of the property they're large uh enclosed facilities but um i don't think that they're going to work for us so they would have to be raised Bo both of them would have yes. to be raised uh, and not perhaps saving part of it for for a new con for a new facility I, I, I should preface that gary by just saying that you know by first look it looks that way you know, you know we just have trying to, to maybe further. save yeah. you know save with with regard to the acreage, how much we how much space we really would need for a new for a new facility? I, I get yeah. the idea of a new facility, you know, and I know there's parts of that that don't fit. I know they, you know, all that's needed within the within the new facility. I get that, but I'm just wondering, you know, the to the great extent that both of those the north, south, east, west. Um, buildings basically would have to um, be raised just so that we would have enough space for the for the new facility I guess that's where I'm going I'm not sure what right. what the decision of the committee will be tonight or if there is a but I think that that you know with regard to West Street the access there I think that's a good it's a good site. I think that that has potential for, for what we need. Um, I know there will be some expense in the raising, but I think in the long term, I think that that's placing that facility in the heart, basically in the heart of the city, and it's not part of the West Side Master Plan coming from the county. I understand, so I still think that that's a facility that parcel is is. Um, 
a very viable situation for me. Great. So um, I'm not sure about the rest of the people that were there or the rest of the committee, but I, I still think I still keep focusing back on that. And I thank you for the tour um, the other day. I, I um, old ironworks and that sort of, that I have that has a lot of history in the city. Uh, but I think that I think that. Um, that that is, in my view, a very viable spot for this new facility. I'm not sure, Mr. Chair, um, what the resolve of this meeting will be, but I just wanted to make that point and thank Eric for that, for that tour and getting us there uh, the other day. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Alder Gisselman. Um, I'm with you. I, I enjoyed the tour thoroughly. I, I thought that it would be a fantastic location. Um, and even if the west, uh, the county's uh, west side business doesn't pan out, there's there's land to expand. I mean, the city has moved businesses before, if if need be, you know, they could possibly move over by their by the road ready place in the future. There's 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 so much potential there, and um, I, I just. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in full agreement with you. And Alder Dini, you were on the tour as well. What is your? You, you know, I did. I like the facility. Of, one of the one of the criteria I think we looked at originally was to try to keep this facility complete rather than splitting the operations. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, uh, so the one of the least desirable uh, options would be to pick something where we're permanently split. Um, and that would be the case with with some of these with the west and i don't know how viable it is do we if if we can get that burned down cold storage building i believe the county owns and then county owns some next to that potentially we we could get all the way to 17th or close to that and have a combined facility does is that potential yeah i think um a lot of that'll be flushed out with how the county wants to use that property with their west side master plan that they're currently working on. Um, I know that they want to expand services to that area that their highway department is currently on for, for the park. And so I don't exactly know all the details on that yet, but um, so. And I, uh, how much more work does Barrientos have to do on this since they just looked at Cleveland this week? Do they have more input they, they'll be able to? Yeah, that, I guess that's one direction I would like from the committee this evening is that you know we're working with a we have funding to do some more work on on looking at this potential sites um, but we haven't really entered into another agreement with Barrientos yet as an amendment because I kind of wanted to narrow down the sites that we might be looking at or considering so I think one of the things with the West Street site would be trying to really more finalize the potential costs by working with the owner you know what uh, selling costs you know leases any other environmental work and things like that that we would have to do um, and then uh, maybe doing a site layout to see what buildings can be salvaged what could be salvaged not raised um, with our turning radiuses and getting these larger vehicles and stuff in and out and what you know what we could use there and then getting a better estimate on the site work so um so if that i mean if uh i mean if the committee's okay with us pursuing that on the west street site uh we would definitely enter into uh you know an agreement with barrientos to have them further that uh information for Is us it my understanding that they were already gonna do some drawings or something for that uh they're willing to but we don't have a contract or oh. an amendment we have to okay. amend the because i know that one them. fellow he was pretty excited yeah, I think I think they both are. To, to, yeah, they are to pretty excited with that forward. site. That so, yeah. Yes, yeah, Alder Asperson. Thank you. So I also um, support the Ironworks site. I think that what we need, though, is to put some real numbers to what it would cost us for relocation. Sometimes relocation can be way more expensive than we figured. Um, and I think that we and we talked about blight in here, and something needs to happen with some of those buildings, especially the one that had the fire. So. You know, I, I also would support Barrientos looking further into that location. Um, you know, we still don't know for sure if the county would ever be interested in selling us its highway shop property. Um, if it has other plans for that, um, 
that that may not be an option but if it is an option we can pretty much bet that they will want to sell it to us at market price yeah so <laughs> we also should have at least in our minds an idea of what market price for that might be um, based on comparable buildings of similar size and condition so just so we kind of know what we're in for um, and and maybe separate from the ironworks site but knowing that if we want an eye on expansion or we want an eye on a broader site you know that for an extra price this is sitting next door That's so good point you know i yep. think i think it's a good idea to keep them split because we may never get that other one the highway one and so but i think we should focus on the both of them and have numbers that we can either use separately or add together you know as we move forward so you know and depending on how that comes out you know i think we also have to keep an open mind about the rest of our options but you know i feel like the existing site did score awfully low I mean, even if a person was to acquire homes nearby, uh, assuming there's buyers that want to sell, that site has its own drawbacks today. Oh. So, you know, if we were going to prioritize the rest of these, you know, we were not real excited about either of the ones that were so far out to the outskirts. You know, even right. when we talked about looking at a property, perhaps in the business campus, that's not super useful for commercial, but the cru the um, uh, users do not want to be that far away from the rest of the city because it's essentially a 20-minute drive across town right. if they need to get somewhere quickly. So, um, you know, I think we should pursue um, some reliable numbers on that West Street and on the Ironworks property. Okay. Um, in case you didn't know, Alder Rasmussen, uh, that burnt-out parcel was acquired by the county, so that's county property now well, as and, well and that I guess begs the question of whether they would expect market rate for that in its current condition or if they'd be willing to deed well, it over. perhaps <laughs> so yeah perhaps maybe you know, the city we, inspections department could get after him to clean it up too. correct <laughs> correct you know, you know but there, that's a, that's there is a story some reason for repair another day. order options there yeah. so you know I oh. think and then that's that was my point is that that may not carry a primo price based on what's going on there I mean the condition of the site so you know I think that's something we need to talk about too Alder Killian, you came forward. Did you have something you wanted to add? Yes, I'll keep it brief, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to uh, request that if any additional contract is done with Barrientos, that this committee and the contract makes it explicitly clear that uh, Cleveland Avenue uh, is, that decision is consistent with the September 2021 council vote, and that is not to be uh, pursued uh, per the council directive of September 2021. And then uh, my last uh, modest request would be since uh, there's supposedly uh, a pursuit of the highest scoring properties I would request from the committee to ensure that that's actually valid that those sites with the highest scores I believe that was 27 not the erroneous 27 on Cleveland Avenue which was probably actually only 23 or so but the ones with 27 that uh, for at least the optics of uh, legitimacy that there's cost estimates put to those sites with the highest scores so the people aren't saddled with some subjective uh, city hall special. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alder Killian. So I, I guess with that, do you want, I mean, even sites that aren't viable that we know aren't viable, do you want I, me to pursue putting costs together I, for those? I, I would say, honestly, you know, based on what we saw yesterday and, and the discussion is, is to go further, you know, with the, with, the, um, with the West Street location and perhaps, you know, exhaust all avenues there, perhaps. I, I don't know. If it, before we move forward, I guess that's a, that's a suggestion. I, I'll leave it to the... Alder Asmussen. Thank you. We, elim we eliminated a couple, though, right away because they were owned by the private sector and likely not for sale, which was the case on Westwood Drive. Oh. Um, we determined that not only was it sacrificing prime commercial development property, but the owner of the parcel was in the room the night we talked about it and kind of chuckled about the fact that there's no way it's for sale for that purpose. So at that point, I mean, to me, that's a non-starter. I don't see that we should waste time or money studying stuff like that. You know, and if we know on some of these other ones that the private sector is resistant to sell, um, you know, and the site isn't viable like the one at ZNX, like you talked about. Well, then, you know, why would we spend money further engineering that? I, I feel exactly. like I feel like stuff that actually makes a difference that we can actually use 
is where we want to spend our money. So, okay. Alder Gisman. So, Eric, you're looking for a motion this evening to proceed then further um, with Barry Antos. Um, were you looking for some guidance from this committee then? Yeah, to, to pursue further investigation of the West Street site and some possible concepts and, and to further the, um, the costs, the total cost of, the, of that site, what it looks like. Yep. So is, the, is the budget all right? We have money. F w yes. You said we had some money laying. <laughs> yeah, in the, um, in the 22 budget. Uh, the city council approved uh, a budget for us to do this, and we haven't used any of that yet because uh, we haven't really narrowed the sites okay. down. So I'll yep. make that motion then, Mr. Chair, um, to proceed and have staff proceed then with regard to the West Street plan and further defining um, s further defining the issues. Thank you, Alder Gisman. We have a motion to move forward with the West Street location. Do we have a second? I'll second, but I think with the clarification that we understand that we want to see the costs for the Marathon County owned highway shop West Street site separate from the ironwork site so that we know if we can't acquire one but we can acquire the other, how much impact yeah. that makes. I, I want to see numbers on both but not as a lump sum. Yeah, makes sense. Just a, a note, that there's a benefit of serving on both the county board and the city council. I think that that West Side Master Plan should be revealed, I think, pretty soon, I would hope. And I think that might be revealing with regard to the future side of that, uh, of the uh, highway department. But also, as part of the the movement of the highway department out, I think there this county is also thinking about the park department, which is just right around the corner. Um, on whatever avenue that is from from the West Street site, so I think there may be some properties close by, but not maybe necessarily adjacent. I'm not sure where the plan on that would be. Okay. Alder Dini. Yeah, that, I guess I'm going to echo what uh, on the name of this. What we what I believe we have scored here is the West Street property is the uh, county piece that does not include the ironworks is that correct it it's well wasa manufacturing is is what the owner's business is right now on the ironworks site so the that you're talking about the piece that burned down uh, that the county owns. so this is the that piece we that we originally looked at what i thought we i thought we originally looked at the county piece as the west side piece or is this no no no. The whole thing? We no. We we looked at the county piece separately um, in the report. You know, so. So the one that scored twenty six on our sheet is that the highway shop piece, not including the ironworks. No, this is the ironworks piece. The piece that the county doesn't own and we don't own. That's privately owned. That's left. Yeah. That's the one that got the twenty six. Yes. On the sheet. Okay. Did you see, did, is it unclear in the report, Doug, that? It's abbreviated. Well, originally the West Street, I thought, was the county piece. When we, it, and then we shifted focus to the property next door. Yeah, we did. And, and it, it was kind of removed from the list because the county at this point, you know, it's not viable because they're, I don't know how many years out before moving. So, so yeah. Yeah, just as far as the name, I, so it's not I confused. Can, I, can, I can change that or make another reference or something to be more clear. So okay. if anything, the best case scenario for that highway shop site, assuming the county would ever want to sell it, is really for expansion and not the core facility because they're so far away from doing right. anything. Yeah. And we need to move faster than that. So, yeah. okay, yeah. thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other further discussion? Uh, motion has been made and seconded to pursue the, for Barrientos to pursue the West Street location. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And none opposed. Thank you. That passes unanimously. And finally, item 11. Presentation on CIP project summary submitted for 20, 
23 budget. Mr. <clears throat> Allen. Yes, yeah, so you know, a lot of the stuff we bring forward obviously gets on future budget, so this just kind of outlines everything. Um, and I guess just to highlight a few of the things here, so uh, if, if we're looking at the DOT projects, um, we would need uh, an additional $150,000 to finish up those plans, and that's um, mainly coming out of TID 10, if you look down the list, and Stewart Avenue, uh, the real estate, um, that plat that you just approved, we had estimated $150,000 to acquire those parcels. Um, 18th Street um, from, from Wisconsin 52, which is East Wausau to sell. Now we received, it was one of the things that came to this committee, STP urban funding, but the city's, uh, and that should say construction behind it, the city's portion of that is $220,000, and the DOT is picking up 70% of the cost. So um, that was before this committee. Uh, we did receive a STP urban grant for West Wassa Avenue, 10th Street to Stevens. Um, and that, that shouldn't say construction behind it, that should say design. So we'd need $200,000 to get that design going. And also um, the DOT has agreed to um, redo State Highway 52 or East Wassa Avenue from 6th to 18th. And that uh, STP, uh, excuse me, that state municipal agreement came before this committee, but we are responsible for, the city is for 25% of that design. So that's where that $58,000 come from. So all those agreements that came to this committee have a cost and that's where that cost is there. Um, and when we get into the street improvements, um, it was, it was uh, Henrietta, 10th Avenue and Grant Street were approved. So those are budget items as you can see. Also, um, and staff applied for grant funding for 17th Avenue from Stewart to Elm. Um, we did receive $400,000 in funding for that. So um, that was capped. That was, so we would need uh, $1.2 million to, uh, on top of that 400000 that the state's giving. So that, um, that is anticipated to be either TID-8 or ARPA funding. And then, you know, the other projects just kind of lay out um, asphalt paving for 350, a little bit in there for alley paving. We have an annual sidewalk project for 150,000. And if you go to the next page, um, storm sewer, as you can see, and it takes quite a bit of the budget. Um, with all those street projects, the storm is bust is is uh, separated out, so we have almost a million dollars worth of storm sewer. Um, I want to also add that um, TJ and I are working up an estimate for the Boss Creek culverts, which cross off on Randolph Street. We've had some issues there, and those are needed replacements. So that we're working a budget for that, but that could be significant depending. Um, we were looking at repair alternatives, and I don't think repair is going to, so those are going to have to be replaced. So that could be a, um, and I don't think we can wait on that, so that could be a significant budget. There's a question mark there, but um, that's going to be a significant project and that'll get added to this yet. Um, and if we go down concrete pavement repairs for 300,000 pavement markings. Um, and I also want to add, um, when you keep going down the list here, um, ramp repairs project, it's, it's I have budgeted uh, 300,000 in there for that. Um, that would be, this year we're doing repairs in the Sears ramp. Next year it'll go to Penny's and then uh, the following year it would go to Jefferson, so it's kind of on a rotating. And that's based on studies we've had done by Walker Parking Consultants. We need to keep investing in the, ma the maintenance of those ramps to make sure they're viable. Can you sure. backtrack on that a little bit? What, what exactly, we're not getting a lot of use currently out of those ramps. Are we wearing something out or is it just, uh, what, what is, can you be more specific as to what we're, capital improvements? This is different than maintenance? This is actually correct. So, I mean, city staff sweeps, um, you know, does the maintenance on lights or what have you in a ramp. These are these are actual physical repairs. Like for this, what was bid out in the uh, Sears ramp just recently, um, replacement of doors and door frames, um, concrete that's spalling where they actually have to come in and mechanically remove it, or they have to repair the post tension cables, or they have to. Um, do overhead ceiling repairs. So it's 
it's ab it's above and beyond what city staff do. This is actual physical repairs of the ramps themselves. Um, so it's important that we keep those ramps up. Now that money used to come out of a parking fund. But we don't have that parking fund anymore. So now that's coming out of these capital projects, which kind of bites into the other. But yeah, this is work that we bid out. Okay, and I and this is maybe not in your uh, sphere of influence, but it, should we be? It, should this be part of our consideration with the with the uh, Waz project down there? I mean, this is an expense that eventually we are not going to own access or own any income on those. I, I'm just wondering out loud. I, I yeah. I'm not going to make a motion on that. And I believe this year's. Um, there was money in this year's budget, but I, would, it, it, I think it's going to be shifted to the TID. There's a proposal out there for that. Correct. Yep. So 280 went to TID. That's yes. or it moved to TID uh, 12, I believe. Yep. But it is, can any of this be deferred, or is it is it hot? Well, I don't like to defer that. <laughs> I mean, that was a re it was a recommendation in the report. I guess you can always push stuff, but it usually makes stuff worse. And if you push it in pennies, then you're pushing it another year in Jefferson. And so it's um, ramps, I would admit ramps are expensive. So if we, um, you know, if you keep going down to the bottom here, the total, what would be asked um, from the general fund would be just a little over $4 million. And now some of that can shift around, obviously, and, and that has to go through the budget process. But I just wanted to show you where some of the agreements that came to this committee and where these funds would be going and also make you aware that I think we're going to have to make a significant ad for those Boss Creek culverts. I would, I, I mean, just the top number off the top of my head, at least 300,000. But we're putting that number together. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer at specific items. Thank you. I have, I have one, I guess, just kind of an update from the CIP committee. The CIP committee's work is in progress now. Um, they have one more committee meeting coming up yet. Um, and so it's been the last two years, it's been our goal to not try to cut infrastructure, to try to let all the infrastructure projects go forward, just because we are so behind on infrastructure. And that is some of the things that our citizens see and feel the most and routinely complain about. So um, this year, though, when the projects all came in from within the departments for their core needs, plus the infrastructure, the infrastructure requests are so high that they use up the entire CIP borrowing budget and then some. And so the committee asked Marianne and Emily Lay to go back to the drawing board and survey um, projects that can either be phased over multiple years or alternative fund sources for some of the other needs because where we're sitting right now is that we would not be able to approve one project off the CIP list if we approve and maintain the entire infrastructure list because the bid costs and the projections are so high. So um, that committee will probably be meeting within the next few weeks and they'll make a recommendation to finance. We'll continue to massage it out. But ordinarily where we normally want to borrow three and a half million dollars for all of the CIP stuff, you'll see that with an ask of like $4 million, there's just no way to do any other work um, because these costs are so, so expensive. But it is something that's very important to citizens, so we're trying not to cut them. Any other further discussion on item 11? Since there's no action needed for item 11, we'll go to item 12. Construction update for 2022 projects. I'll start. Um, so the Campus and Burek Water Main project, um, that was completed earlier this week with the paving. There are some finer uh, restoration items to be completed yet, but for the most part, that one's completed. Uh, the Bugby reconstruction, that is ongoing and progressing well. Uh, they have one more block of underground work, and then they're going to start building the road. Fourth uh, Avenue which is from Bridge Street to Knox. That is um, their building road now, and that is on schedule uh, to be completed by the end of the month. Fourth uh, Street, McClellan to uh, Scott. Scott, yes. Uh, curb was poured today. Uh, we should have all of our sidewalks done next week, and then paving completed by the end of the month. 
um, Torney, which is from Town Line to McDonald. Um, we did have a couple of delays with that project due to some uh, utilities. Uh, WPS had all, uh, put in new poles, so uh, Frontier and Comcast had to move their uh, lines off of those poles. And it's difficult coordinating with those guys, but because the right-of-way is so narrow there, the contractor didn't want to get started until that work was completed. So they will be starting on Monday. Um, they have started removing some of the asphalt, but the majority of the work will be uh, starting Monday. Um, there may be a little bit of a delay in that, but we're still working to complete that by the end of October. Uh, and then the last one that I have is the business campus trail that we talked about earlier. And we're going to start bidding that next Tuesday, open up bids first part of October, and then the construction will be um, throughout next year. Nate, I guess a couple other projects. The asphalt overlay is done. We talked about that was done in the last committee. Uh, we do have concrete pavement that will be starting September 18th, concrete pavement repair, which will include uh, this one block of Grant out in front of City Hall, the one block of Fourth from Grant to McClellan. It'll include uh, Bridge Street, from the bridge to 6th Street. Um, there's a lot of repairs out there. And then it'll also re include some repairs on uh, Grand Avenue from Kent Street to Lakeview Drive. But that'll be starting on the 18th. Uh, sidewalk projects, the miscellaneous sidewalk project repairs, that's done. And I think that's about it. Any questions on that report? Then we have one more item left on the agenda. I would make a motion we adjourn. I'll second. Motion by Dinny to adjourn and second by Alder Hinkey. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 That's unanimous. Have a good evening, everybody.